Hello guys and welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we are having another episode of Accidental Awesomeness and today we are talking about the discovery of Warfarin. So let's get into it. All right, so before I get started, I do have to say that if you take this medication, you cannot use the information that I'm telling you in this video as a reason to stop taking your medication. If you take Warfarin, you still have to take it. So picture this scene. It's the 1920s Wisconsin. You are a cattle farmer. And you walk out to the fields to check on your cows or whatever you do in the morning. And a bunch of them are dead. You're like, what the shit? We examine them and you take them to the specialist in your area, the cattle specialist, and you're like, what's going on? And they're like, well, they simply bled to death. I don't know what happened. And you're a cattle farmer and you're like, what the hell is this? So the cattle farmers did a lot of research within what they fed their cows, what they treated them with. It came to be discovered that they were feeding them a grain called sweet clover, and it was actually going moldy in the, in the hay or whatever. So that was causing their issues. How they isolated this, I'm not sure. It was just trial and error or what, but uh, the issue with it was that these Farmers didn't have a lot of money to buy new grain or buy different grain to plant to then feed their cows. So they kind of had no choice. They had to feed them this, even though they knew it could potentially kill them. So one cattle farmer's like, you know what? Screw this. I'm not losing any more cattle. So he took a bale of hay, this clover, sweet clover, a j big old jar of uncoagulated blood, and a whole cow to the University of Wisconsin. And it's late at night. And he walks in and he's looking for anybody who's still there to help him because he drove like a couple hours to get there and he was like, you know what, somebody's got to be here that can help me. So he stumbles upon Professor Carl Link's office and Carl Link is probably like, this guy literally just brought a jug of blood into my office. And he's probably thinking that he is probably the most unlucky person in the world right now. But, as luck would have it, he actually was pretty lucky for having this person walk into his office. The farmer's like, can you help me? I don't know what to do because all my, all my cows are dying and I don't know what to feed them. The professor's like, well, stop feeding them this grain and maybe do a transfusion. Yeah, can you imagine doing a transfusion on a cow? Can you imagine? Yeah, because they'd probably sit perfectly still for you, too. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, good, good, good suggestion, though. Yeah, so he couldn't really help the farmer at that point, but he left the hay and the blood, and he was like, well, I guess I've got to do something with this shit, because he didn't take it with him. So he started studying it and did a lot of testing, and he did, he did do animal trials. It is what it is. I can't take back time. So he did a lot of animal trials to discover how it was working and what kind of mechanisms was making it do what it was doing. Eventually, after many, many years of testing, they did finally isolate that the caus causative agent was dicumerol, and they did use dicumerol to develop a different medication used for the same purpose. So initially, this medication was marketed as rat poison because when they were doing animal testing, they found that it worked particularly well on rodents. So instead of killing cows, it could kill the rodents that were eating your grains and bothering your house or whatever you might need rat poison for. So at this point, there were many other anticoagulants on the market, including heparin and dicumerol. The issues with these two medications is that heparin can only be administered either IV or sub-Q. You can't take an oral heparin pill. So obviously it's not very convenient for people either going to do it to themselves or have to go to the hospital every day to get their heparin shot or whatever. Not very convenient. And with dicumerol, although it worked well, it did not work as fast as Warfarin did. So it had a really long latent phase, so it would be in your system for a long time before it actually started to have a therapeutic effect, so it was hard to manage. So they knew how Warfarin worked, and in 1955, President Eisenhower had a heart attack and they knew that they needed to treat heart attacks with anticoagulants at the time. So while they were starting to market warfarin as a actual drug for people, people were obviously afraid to take it. They're like, um, it's rat poison. No, I'm not taking that. Fuck off. So they gave it to the president, and so people's public opinion really changed. Like, well, if it's good enough for him, I guess it's good enough for me. Kind of, yeah. I mean, that's one way to do it. 
So the name Warfarin comes from Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, W-A-R-F, and then they added the rest of it to finish out the drug name. So that's why it's called Warfarin, but when they started to market it as a human drug, they called it Coumadin. So that's why you hear both of those terms, and usually Warfarin is considered the generic and Coumadin is brand name. Professor Link did go on to win several awards for his research on this topic, and then he did pass away from heart failure in 1978. It did not say in the article if he ever needed to take Coumadin himself, but that would be ironic if he did, but none of these articles say that the, the person who invented these weird inventions ever needed their invention. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, please comment down below and let me know, and hit that subscribe button if you feel so inclined. It really helps out my channel. You can find me on social media, uh, at, on Instagram, at Megasol, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.